Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for our special Celebration of Earl program. And here to get things underway is Orioles broadcaster, Fred Manfred. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for coming tonight as we gather together as friends and family to celebrate and honor the great Earl Weaver. We are joined by many familiar faces, including that of Earl's lovely wife, Mariana, who we enjoyed seeing along with Earl at each of the six Legend Series sculpture unveilings last season. We are so grateful that you can be here again, Mariana. We also welcome more than 30 members of Earl and Mariana's family who have traveled here to be with us. Thank you for coming. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge Earl's longtime friend and representative, Dick Gordon. Dick. As well as nearly two dozen former Orioles who played for Earl and who have joined us here tonight, some of whom you will hear from in just a few moments. Now, on a personal level, being a native Baltimorean, I grew up an Orioles fan all my life and, of course, knew Earl Weaver as the manager, Earl Weaver. And then about 15 years ago, I started having fun with Earl Weaver every winter on a Caribbean cruise. It was something that I will treasure, those moments, those stories, and the way Earl treated every cruiser like a personal friend and a member of the family. One thing that I, that I have to say about Earl, whether he was playing shuffleboard, ping pong, or win, lose, or draw, that demeanor that you saw on the field, that competitive desire, was always there. Let's just say Earl never liked to lose. Look back at the greatest manager in Orioles history. How does it happen that a person who tried for 10 years to reach the major leagues as a player and another 10 years as a minor league manager, a manager who was just happy to be in baseball, ever reached the major leagues? took a lot of guts by certain people. The people who were not afraid to give an unknown a chance must have taken a lot of courage for them to turn a major league club over to me. And if they knew how nervous I was, they might have had second thoughts. And now it's time to recognize a group of baseball people that very seldom receive credit for a job well done. This group being the umpires of the American and National League. Their integrity and honesty is and must be beyond reproach. Now, counting balls and strikes and close plays on the bases, they must have made over a million calls while I was managing. And except for those 92 times I disagreed, they got the other ones right. Now I'd like to say that the 35 some odd years I spent in baseball flew by so fast that I didn't even know I was getting older. The time was so enjoyable, especially when you're lucky enough to be making a living doing something you love. There were some hard times, but believe me, the good far outweighed the bad. In closing, let me tell you, I'm proud of my record. I'm proud of the fact that I was even considered to be in the Hall of Fame, let alone voted in. I'm proud of the fact that I spent my whole major league career in one city. And for that, I would like to thank the wonderful fans of Baltimore for letting me stay.
Now that's the Earl we all remember and love. Now while honoring Earl on June 30th last season with a bronze sculpture, which stands tonight in Oriole Legends Park, we took a detailed look at his incredible journey to the Hall of Fame manager. Here's just a brief summary of the great on-field accomplishments of Earl Weaver. He started as a minor league second baseman in 1948 in the Cardinals organization. In 1956, already a five-time minor league all-star and a three-time league MVP, Earl began his managerial career as a player manager. The next season in 1957, Earl joined the Orioles organization as manager of their Class D club in Fitzgerald, Georgia. Then, after 10 consecutive winning seasons as minor league manager, Earl was promoted to serve as the Orioles' first base coach in 1968, and later that season was named manager. In his first three full seasons as Orioles manager beginning in 1969, Earl led the Orioles to 109, 108, and 101 wins respectively. With all three teams making trips to the World Series and capturing the title in 1970. In his first 12 full seasons as manager, his teams won 100 games five times, 90 or more games 10 times, and in his 17 year Major League managerial career, all with the Orioles. Earl had 1,480 wins and captured six American League East titles, four American League pennants, and of course, the 1970 World Series championship. The impressive winning percentage ranks Earl eighth in Major League Baseball history for managers with 10 or more years of experience and earned him induction into the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1996. Let's welcome a man now who can probably recite all of the facts by himself and who spoke on Earl's behalf back in June at Earl's sculpture unveiling, the president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, Mr. Jeff Idelson. Jeff. Thank you, Fred. It's an honor to be here tonight to represent Cooperstown. Today is a fitting tribute for a man whose legacy is well documented, whose accomplishments are so plentiful, and who adored having a plaque in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Like a great chess player, Earl continuously outmaneuvered the opposition. It wasn't very hard to tell that he had the smarts and leadership skills to guide a ball club and do so successfully. He was a master of getting the most out of his players. And when the time came for him to be considered for the Hall of Fame, his body of work spoke for itself. The rules for election to the Baseball Hall of Fame are straightforward. They instruct voters to look at a candidate's contributions to the game, as well as his character, integrity, and sportsmanship. Earl passed with flying colors. There was no one smarter in the dugout, no one who respected the game more than he did, and no one who managed the game with more passion and determination than Earl, especially when the chips were down. And in 1996, when Earl was part of an induction class that included Ned Hanlon, who managed the National League Orioles from 1892 to 1898, they became just the 12th and 13th managers elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Of the nearly 700 manager league major league managers in baseball history, there are but 19 of them in Cooperstown today, including Earl. That is a select group. Earl's election was richly deserved. When he got the call to say he had been elected to the Hall of Fame in March of 1996, he wore his humility, pride, and competitive spirit on his sleeve. He said at the time, the minute I heard the news, my knees got weak and my hands got weak. But I was laying about 90 yards out on a par five, my hands shook, 
I wound up taking a bogey and blowing the whole front side. Once I got over to shock, I hit the ball very good. Classic Earl, even though he had just received the news of a lifetime, he rallied and won the round. Earl loved the museum in Cooperstown and seeing the game's history unfold in front of him. The first time we walked through the hallowed halls of Cooperstown, he marveled at items from his boyhood St. Louis Cardinals. His face lit up when he saw our Orioles exhibit that included his 1982 jersey, along those of Brooks, Frank, Cal, and Jim, and next to a bat wielded by Eddie, all guys he respected so much. One of the more unique items we displayed in his election year was an Earl Weaver tomato plant starter kit that Dick Gordon loaned us. We did so to give fans outside of Baltimore a glance into the human side of Earl, which included bullpen gardening skills. Earl takes one look at this on display and says, inside a museum. Classic Earl. It was almost as if, if he and Yogi Berra drank from the same water fountains growing up in St. Louis. In all seriousness, Earl Weaver wore the Hall of Fame mantle well. He was so proud of his accomplishments and his elect that he beamed whenever he was with Hall of Famers or at Hall of Fame events. Since his induction in 1996, Earl rarely missed Hall of Fame weekend, I believe maybe once in 17 years. He loved to come back with Mariana each year and sit in rocking chairs on the veranda at the Otisaga Resort Hotel. And for hours, he would visit with his Oriole compadres, banter with Hall of Famers from opposing team, and fondly relive memorable moments with rival managers. Unfortunately, the only living umpire elected during his tenure as a Hall of Famer was Doug Harvey from the National League, so I did not see any heated arguments in Cooperstown, and Earl was never ejected from our little village. We were always extremely grateful for how supportive Earl and Mariana were of every Baseball Hall of Fame event that we asked them to attend. And it didn't matter if it took place in Cooperstown, Baltimore, Houston, Los Angeles, or Tampa. Earl always had a wide smile on his face and expressed his profound love for the game and the Hall of Fame. Earl was an icon and so loved by us all. He was a legend, but our memories and his legacy will live on forever. We deeply miss the Earl of Baltimore, as you know him, Hall of Famer Earl Weaver, as he's known around the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I now ask a man who is certainly familiar with the Hall of Fame to share his memories of his manager. Oh. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much. The celebration of Earl, beautiful words. Mariana, we love you too, hon. You have been in our thoughts and prayers for the last few months, and believe me, you are family. It's nice to see you. We, li we loved Earl, and I'm sure he loved us. He probably loved us a little more when we won a few games for us. I think all the players here today will tell you that we all butted heads with Earl every once in a while, but we admired him, that's for sure. I think I admired him most of all because here's a young guy about this high who used to tag along after his dad. He lived in St. Louis, and they would go to the ballpark. And all he ever wanted to do was to play for the St. Louis Cardinals. He signed a contract with the Cardinals and played in the minor leagues and did extremely well. The MVP, as Fred told you, all-star teams in the minor leagues, went to the Pirates for a short time in the minor leagues, but never made it to the big leagues. And then he decided, well, I'm gonna try managing. And he got a job with the Baltimore Orioles, 
and went to spring training in, uh, I think it was in Florida, yes. But anyway, started out in D-ball, C-ball, B, A, Triple A, Major Leagues, Hall of Fame. You cannot beat that. It was terrific. As a manager, he was terrific. We all loved him. He ran the game well. I think even the other teams that we played against realized, hey, those guys got the best manager in the league. And I think they all, uh, they, uh, they knew that. As a, as a team, Earl got everyone involved in the game. No one sat long, everyone played, and they knew what their job was. I know the umpires did not like to see Earl, Earl run out on the field. I think that he knew the, the rule book better than the umpires. You know, when he did come out, we all watched to see what was going to happen. And if you're on the field, I can remember many times putting my glove over my face and just laughing at some of the things that Earl did on the field. But anyway, we all admired and respected Earl, and we're certainly thinking of him now. We're thinking about you, Earl, right now. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brooks. Now, I know this man has plenty to share about his former manager. Here's the Orioles Hall of Fame catcher, Rick Dempsey. Thank you. I am very honored to be here today to speak on behalf of Earl Weaver. But before I begin, Mariana and the Weaver family, I would like to apologize to you for what I am about to say. <laughs> Earl Weaver, once he put that uniform on, was one of the toughest, most miserable human beings you ever want to be around on a baseball field. I was traded to the Baltimore Orioles back in 1976, and I joined the ball club in Chicago and he called me in the office to say, Rick, you're probably not gonna play for a while. I had just come from the Yankees in first place by 12 games ahead of the Orioles. I didn't know why he wanted to tell me that, but I guess he took it upon himself to tell every player exactly when he was going to play and when he wasn't. But he was right. For the first week and the rest of that road trip, I didn't play at all. So I was pretty miserable about the fact that I wasn't even, didn't even have an at-bat when I came back to, or, to the Baltimore. But my name was in the lineup that first day against Kansas City, and they were running the Orioles ragged at that time. Amos Otis came up, and I threw him out at second base. Willie Wilson came up, I threw him out at second base, and George Brett came up and tried to steal, and I threw him out. From that point, Earl started to play me a little bit more on a regular basis. So he called me in the office and he said, listen, there's one rule. He says, whatever that pitcher wants to throw, that's what I want you to call. If he shakes you off, give him the pitch he wants. But if I tell you what I want you to throw, you listen to me. We're in Milwaukee, Sexto Lascano was in the lineup. He says, I don't want you to throw Sexto Lescano a fastball. Mike Flanagan got on the mound and I called curveball. He shook me off. I called slider. He shook me off. I called changeup. He shook me off. I know he only had one other pitch to fastball, so I called curveball again. He shook me off. So I called the fastball and Sexto Lescano got a base hit. When I got back to the dugout, it was hell to pay. Jesus, I told you not to call the fastball to Sexto Lescano. I said, you also told me to call the pitch to one who wanted to pitch and he wanted to throw a fastball. And later on in the game, I missed a pop-up behind on plate and he said I'd had enough. About five times in my career, he had said, Rick, you're out of the game. 
I never paid any attention to him. I just put my uniform, my catcher's equipment on and went back out on the field and he never said anything. That day, I saw Dave Skaggs run across the outfield and I thought, oh no, he's serious, we're in Milwaukee. And he comes out to the umpire with the lineup card and he says, ump, you see Dempsey's name right there? He says, he's out of the game. And if he doesn't leave, I forfeit. So I got mad at him when I came back in the dugout. Frank Robinson was coaching for us at the time. And as I took every piece of equipment off, I threw it at him. I threw my shin guard, it went like a boomerang to the left, and the other one went like a boomerang to the right. And when I got to my mask, I knew I could hit him with that. So I threw it down at his feet but it hit the helmet and the helmet hit him. So he picked up a helmet and threw it back at me. So here we were, the manager of a major league baseball team and we're throwing equipment at each other on both sides of the dugout until finally Frank Robinson grabbed me and said, Rick, you better go to the shower. So I was so mad that he actually took me out that time. I tore off my uniform. I got down to my underwear and my socks and my shoes and I went into the shower anyway. About a minute later, I hear those little feet coming up the stairway after me, so I went to the back of the shower. With the warm water going over my head, I was pretending I couldn't hear him. And Earl was like, geez, I'm the manager of this team. You have to do what I tell you to do. When I say leave the field, you better leave the field. From now on, I won't put you back in that lineup. I am the boss. I am the boss. I said, yes, Earl, you are the boss. Spelled backward, double S-O-B. <laughs> you think Palmer and him had battles. There was one time in Toronto, we lost the game 24 to 10. And I made two throwing errors trying to pick somebody off because we couldn't get anybody out. He called me in the office afterwards. I was scared to death. It was the first time he ever really yelled at me. He put, picked up a wooden box and he put it in front of me and then he stood on top of it so he could be taller than me. If you ever throw another ball away like that again, I'm gonna go to AAA ball and get that little fat guy and he's gonna replace you. And I yelled back at him, I said, well, you better go get him because I'm never going to stop throwing, Earl. And that's the way our relationship was. And it was kind of funny because I did. I hated him every day of my life that I had that uniform on. And I left the Orioles in 1986, and I went off and played a couple more years. And towards the end of my career, I played for the Dodgers and won a championship with them. And I was... Uh, Thinking back on my career at Earl Weaver and how much I truly did hate him. And I said, you know something, now that it's all over with, and I look back, I actually loved him. Because he helped me to be a winner. He helped us all to be a winner. And you learn to play the game right when you listen to Earl, no matter how tough he was. I was able to put three championship rings on my finger, and I'll never forget him as being the greatest manager I ever played for and the greatest manager in the game. God bless you, Earl. I love you now. Classic baseball stories, Rick. Thank you very much. How about now if we hear from a Hall of Famer and an Orioles legend who just happens to be baseball's Iron Man. Number eight, Hal Ripken. Thank you so much. I don't hate Earl. Matter of fact, it was kind of the opposite for me. My dad was very close to Earl. Matter of fact, he was so close that Earl fired him at least 10 times from the hotel bar. <laughs> um, 
Earl gave me my opportunity. In 1982, I'm sure most of you guys remember, um, I was three for five opening day, including a home run in my first at bat, a double, uh, great day. And then I went four for my next 63. And Earl had me in the office every single day trying to pump me up. But thinking back on it, he played me every single day at third base. And many managers or many situations would not have the guts to put me in there and, and allow me to play. So I owe a debt of gratitude certainly for Earl to keep me in there. He also moved me from third base to shortstop. And he did that one day without any notice. I came to the ballpark and there was a six next to my name instead of the standard five. I thought he just made a mistake. But he called me into his office and said, I'm playing you at shortstop tonight. And if they hit a ground ball to you, I want you to catch it. And then I want you to get a good grip on it. Take your time and throw it over to first base and make a good throw. And if he's safe at first base, he's only on first. He's not on second. I guess he was telling me not to try to do too much. But I think I decided at that moment that I needed a, a new infield instructor. But I had a chance to see the softer side of Earl. I know everybody had a chance to see Earl out here in the field arguing and motivating players. Um, Rick and Earl had a very special relationship. Jim and Earl had a very special relationship. Big Eddie Murray over there had a very special relationship. Big Ed. But Earl showed me so much compassion, so much understanding, and he was willing uh, to stick with me. And forever, I owe him a debt of gratitude for that opportunity. I only played for Earl for a very short period of time, but I wish that I would have played for him uh, forever. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cal. Received word from two Hall of Famers. Frank Robinson and Jim Palmer. Mariana, they both wanted to be here, but due to circumstances, they could not be here. They send their best to you and your family and to all of Baltimore. Next, I invite the man who now has the job Earl once had to come share his memories of the great number four, Orioles manager, Buck Showalter. You notice how far I had to move the microphone down from all these big guys. I, I think Earl would have had to move it down a little too. You know, when I, when I think about Mr. Weaver, he, w he finally talked me into calling him Earl probably the last spring training. <clears throat> what it meant to him to come to spring training and be a part of uh, our, our team down there and the impact he made on us. It's an honor to be a manager of the Baltimore Orioles because of Earl Weaver. I was always not surprised, but honored how closely he followed us. You know, he'd grab me to the side and say, I uh, think you're bunting a little too much. Uh, you know, I really like that Weeders guy behind the plate. He might be as good as Dempsey one day. But how much he meant to the city of Baltimore. But understand how much Baltimore meant to Earl. He uh, cared so sincerely about the Baltimore Orioles. Have him down in spring training and have him walk around and uh, ride around to the different drills. He used to say, Show Walter, are you trying to reinvent reinvent baseball here. We were doing this 40 years ago at Maduro Stadium in Miami. You got a few more coaches, you got a few more fungos, but we're all trying to do the same thing. He said the Oriole way is being brilliant in the basics. 
He said, don't make it too complicated. Quite frankly, the Oriole way was the Weaver way. And it, I think more than anything, the thing I'll remember about Earl was he gave me his time. And, and it meant a lot to me coming in here because Earl was one of those guys that players, coaches, teammates wanted to please. He was a guy, whatever you may have had your run-ins, you wanted to please him because he wanted one thing. He wanted the Orioles to be good, and he wanted to win. Mariana, God bless you. I wish I could have been there for the funeral, and I want to tell you right now, there's no place I'd rather have been, but I knew we were going to be here today. I think more than anything, I just uh, feel honored to have had him pass my way. I think everybody up here feels the same way. He impacted all our lives, and every day before the game starts, I always give a little look at the plaque in the dugout, and uh, it's not a pat on the back. It's, by God, you better be good today. So I keep that in mind. An honor to be asked to even speak here today, especially with these greats. So. Thank you, and I just hope we can continue to honor Earl by playing the game right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Buck. I remember being on the cruise with Earl this past winter, and word came via the Internet on the ship that the Orioles had extended the contract of Dan Duquette and, of course, Buck Showalter. And... We were at, just happened to be at a party, and uh, Earl said, what's going on back in Baltimore, Fred? And I mentioned that to him. He didn't say a word. He sat back, folded his arms, and had a great big smile on his face. He knew what this man and Dan mean to the Orioles. Finally. Let's hear from a man who knew Earl as far more than an Orioles legend or a manager. Here is Earl's son, Mike Weaver, to share some of his memories of his dad. Mike. Thank you. To the baseball world, he was a Hall of Famer. To you, the fans of Baltimore, he was an icon. The Earl of Baltimore, not only the on-field general, but the leader of the organization. The Oriole way to which he was indoctrinated coming through the farm system became his way. And as the many years passed, his way became the Oriole way. To us, our family, he was also a leader. Someone any of us could turn to any time. He was always, always there for us. To me, he was just dad. Truly my best friend. Billy Crystal did a Broadway play called 700 Sundays. About the day each week he spent with his father. For me and dad, it was Monday, my favorite day of the week. Golf at 11 for about 15 years. Then, as his health began to fail, it was the racetrack. But regardless, make room for Dad on Monday. It was our time together, a time to discuss sports, politics, finances, discuss whatever. It was my time with my dad. For those of you here today with your father or your son or your family, treasure this time you're spending. Appreciate these moments and hold them dear to your heart. They don't last forever, but the memories will. For me, the memories of Monday with my dad for you all, the fans of Baltimore, 
the memories of Earl Weaver, the Earl of Baltimore. He sounds like his dad, doesn't he? Thank you, Mike. And now, we are pleased to welcome Terry Cashman, who is here to perform the tribute he wrote to honor Earl many years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, Terry Cashman with the Earl of Baltimore. The Earl of Baltimore. Thank you, Terry. And before we end our program, we'd like Earl's son, Mike, to have tonight's ceremonial first pitch honors. Mike, you ready to go? You ready, warmed up? Yeah. Rick? Where you go, Mike? In the golden age of baseball. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. I'm sure you would all agree that Earl Weaver will forever hold a special place in our hearts. And now we invite you to sit back and enjoy tonight's game. Thank you again. 
for coming, everyone. Thank Colorful you. Colorful and studied, he always spoke his mind.